So tonight we will be finishing Obadiah. Um, that's right, and ladies and gentlemen, kids of all ages, we will be finishing the book of Obadiah. That wasn't too bad, right? It was like, what, five weeks? Yeah, that wasn't too bad. And, uh, you know, we had that break in between. So, but okay, so let's go over the structure one more time. Uh, we got the introduction, that's verse 1. The judgment, verses 2 through 10, you know, where he says, you know, uh, talks about Esau being perched up. Uh, like a vulture. Uh, the charge, that's where he talks about what he actually did wrong. We looked at that um, last, I think it was last week, I think, um, and how he was uh, not just intending, I mean, had, a, you know, not just his attitude, but he was actually going out intending to do evil to someone else. So let's go a little bit of a review. After telling Esau he was bringing punishment, God charged him not just for his attitude against Israel, but with keeping watch so as to cause pain and hurt to God's people who had already suffered. So um, that's kind of a big point that they, that that when you literally setting out to hurt and to cause harm, like if you're doing something right and and you hurt somebody else, that that's even a step above this. They were literally going out so as to cause somebody harm. You know, like I'm gonna go out today and see whose day I can cuss up. You know, that this just pretty jacked up. So Esau thought that they were justified, but the truth was that Babylon was a nation called to punish and punish Israel, not Esau. And uh, just as Israel drank punishment in Jerusalem, so Esau and the nations would as well. Esau, uh, Israel was still God's people. That was one of the things we looked at last last week. These are people who thought that they were abandoned by God for whatever reason. And then God made it absolutely clear throughout this prophecy that Israel was still God's people. The land was still his land. Though the covenant had been broken by Israel and God had punished them, the book of Obadiah opens up the potential for a future that, you know, some form of the covenant still existed. And although it's not necessarily overly clarified, it is presented. So we'll finish up the end of the bad good news, which was verses 15 through 18. And for that, I'll review um, the verse 15, which I know we already looked at it last week. Just kind of review it to remind you what's going on. For the day of the Lord is near for all the nations. Just as you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. For just as you drank on my holy mountain. Now we talked about the way that it's at, it, it switches person. So it's probably talking about Jerusalem. Like, okay. So it's probably talking about it, um, Esau here. For the day of the Lord is near for all the nations. Just as you have done, Esau, it will be done to you, Esau. Your dealings will return on your own head. For just as you drank, now it switches over to, to Israel. Just as Israel drank on my holy mountain. All the nations will drink continually. That's one of the problems of reading the Bible in English is it wasn't actually intended for English. So you just kind of miss some of the some of what's being said. All the nations will drink continually. So, okay, you, you suffered, Israel. Well, now it's their turn. And um, and they, won't, they will drink and become as if they had never existed. And I, I told my lame joke about Rango last week, as if they had never existed. <laughs> so anyways... Um, so there's there's two possible interpretations here when it says um, just uh, let's see become as if they had never existed. There's two possible interpretations for that. First off, they will be completely and utterly destroyed, or it might just be saying you they will be, the nations will be made completely and in, in, completely insignificant. So maybe they will still continue to some degree. They just won't have the same prestige that they had previously. Um, here it says in verse 16, For just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. That's a little bit misleading. Um, it doesn't mean drink and keep on drinking for all of eternity. That's how we kind of read that in English. Once again, the problems of translations. Drink continually doesn't mean an ongoing thing. It doesn't mean forever. It means keep on drinking until it is all gone. They will drink the cup completely. They will drink it. So, so when it says they will drink continually, it means they will drink ongoing until the cup is, is empty. Not that the cup will never run empty. Okay, well, I hope that that kind of makes sense because it, it is kind of hard to understand what's being said in English. So, okay, does everybody understand what I just said? Yes. Kind of. That, that it's not that they will drink the cup for forever. You're still giving me that look. It's not that they that the cup will never run empty of judgment. Um, they will drink the cup to the very end of it. To the brine, is how I guess you'd say it. Um, does that make sense? Makes kind of? <laughs> Total sense. It's okay. <laughs> um, plus, now I've put her on the spot, so she's like, I really can't, I really don't know what the heck's going on now. <laughs> um, 
And the the interesting thing about all this is that the nation's power struggle is completely irrelevant at this point. See, they all think that they're fighting for power of who's going to control who, right? From from their perspective. So they conquered Israel, they conquered Judah, they you know they, they uh, they're going to conquer Esau. Meanwhile, they don't understand that God has his own purposes and he's doing his own thing. And their little power struggles are completely irrelevant because God is the one actually behind what's what's happening here and bringing punishment to Jerusalem and now bringing punishment to the to the nations. And um okay, so now let's get on with verses uh, 17 through 18. But on Mount Zion there will be those who escape, and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their property. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be like stubble, and they will set them on fire and consume them. Excuse me. So that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So, let's go through this. There's a lot being said here. Um, the the basic idea here is that Israel will get their land back, Esau will be destroyed. Okay, that's the basic idea here. So, on Mount Zion there will be those who escape, and notice this, and it will be holy. So, uh, the mount, and I think I mentioned this last week, let me see. No, it's right here on my notes. As Jerusalem had been defiled by the Jews when they disobeyed God and they were living in sin, but it had also been, uh, been defiled by the invaders. However, it wouldn't remain that way. That implies also that the people living on holy Mount Zion would be holy themselves because the unholy cannot live in the holy. So there's an implication here when it says, but on Mount Zion there will be those who escape and it will be holy. And the people there will be holy too. <laughs> no more defiling with, with idol worship and all that stuff. Um, so this is kind of interesting though it says but on mount zion there will be those who escape now the context makes it out to be like it's talking about um uh only israelites um that that, that there will be israelites who, who escape but i think that it might have a wider application here i think that it, it might be saying hinting at from the nations and israel people will turn to the lord and be saved I, I think that there's an implication there. Um, that's not the, directly what's being stated. Directly what's being straight, stated is that Israelites, there, there will be a remnant that remains, that, that is saved. Um, however, the, this remnant, they will be, they will be holy. The, which, what is holiness? It's being set apart for, for God's purposes. Um, and Mount Zion will be holy again. Now, this is very important. So we talked about how Israel is still, still God's people. And how how um, last week we talked about how the land is still God's land, and now he adds another thing to it. Holiness, the covenant will be restored. It isn't hopeless. But on Mount Zion there will be those who escape, and it will be holy. In other words, God's saying, "I am not finished yet. We're revisiting the covenant." This is an extremely important thing because when Jesus came, he came as a Jew to the Jews. And the covenant was still in effect at that time. So here it says the house of Jacob, uh, that would be all of Israel. He could have said the house of Judah. He could have said um, Jerusalem, which would have been symbolic for the southern kingdom. But instead he says the house of Jacob, all of Israel. And the house of Jacob will possess their property. Israel will once again have their inheritance. And then the house of Joseph. Joseph is the dominant one in, in Israelite history. He's uh, The um, tribe of Joseph is often talked about in, in the sense of um, power or a dominant thing going on. Um, Ephraim and Manasseh, if you read the Old Testament prophets, um, Ephraim is often oftentimes a symbol of Israel or the northern kingdom. So here saying the house of Joseph is talking about, you know, the the main group of it. Um, <clears throat> I already mentioned that. Um, how do you guys like this, where I have the verse up there and I have my notes on my screen so you can see the verses that we're going through? It seemed like it was a little bit harder to follow along when I didn't have the verses up. I like it like this. Yeah? Okay. All right. Um, okay. And then it says here, and the wording in, in Hebrew is, is very, is kind of funny to me. Um, I don't remember exactly how it reads, but it's something like this. Uh, the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. So it's something like that. The, the idea here is that Israel will once again possess their land. And this is a promise that will that, that is actually fulfilled shortly after this. Remember, um, Obadiah prophesied sometime around 550. In 538, Persia allowed for them to return, the remnant. 
and then in um, two hundred and something BC, the Maccabees were having their revolt and they had their land again. I don't remember the exact dates for the Maccabean revolt. Um, anyways, it doesn't matter. Then the Hasmonean dynasty and all that stuff. I'm, if you guys read First and Second Maccabees, you get it yourself. Um, but um, whenever that happened, sometime in the 400, 200, somewhere in there, um, you know, they had that, and they were pretty much sovereign until Rob, Rome came, if I remember correctly. And um, in about 64, I want to say, Rome then kind of took control over. The land. Anyways, um, I, I, I apologize. Those I didn't. I didn't. It's been a long time since I studied that Israel and that that period of Israelite history, and it's very shaky. So I might have had some of those details in history um, wrong. But you get the main idea. Um, so whereas Obadiah had switched had switched previously to talk about how judgment was going to come on all the nations. Here we see him once again switching back to Esau specifically. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame, but the house of Esau will be like stubble. So here we, we're, we went from Esau to the nations back to Esau again. Um, so focusing again on Esau, Israel is to destroy Edom with no pity after Babylon is done with them because they were so relentless to Israel. This is kind of an interesting thing. So Esau is going to be punished by Babylon. Okay, but then... Then we have something kind of weird. We have God literally instructing Israel to destroy Esau, just as Esau was destroying Israel. Very interesting. And in fact, in the next verse, after 18, you're going to see wording that is borrowed strongly from the Canaanite conquest back in the book of Joshua. And uh, so very much so talking, not quite holy war, but real freaking close <laughs> um then the house of jacob will be a fire the house of joseph a flame and esau is going to be the stubble and they will set them on fire and consume them israel will set esau on fire and consume them now this was literally um fulfilled and i will talk about that in just a second um but i do want to point out that this prophecy was for a specific time and jesus later so 500 years after this, Jesus gives a separate prophecy about fleeing Jerusalem and its destruction. He says about the way that the temple will be destroyed, the city will fall. He says, woe to those who are in the city when this happens. Pray that you're not in labor when it happens. And he's talking about Jerusalem being destroyed, which happened in 70 AD. So we, you shouldn't think that Obadiah is somehow contradicting Jesus or, the, or vice versa. They're giving two different prophecies for two different times. Obadiah is talking about the restoration. Jesus is talking about, about the Jerusalem falling. So, okay, um, now let's talk about how this was fulfilled. After the nations had abused Edom in 550 or whatever we said it was BC, um, they lost their land. So then they moved south into, into the southern, southern border of the Judah into their area called the Negev. And they had, um, until they had, uh, what am I trying to say here? And, uh, okay, so that's what I'm trying to say. And so Israel kind of just accepted them in their southern borders because they didn't quite have the strength and organization yet to do anything about Esau, or Edom, I guess you could say. Um, but then uh, under the Maccabees, they reconquered their land in, in, the, in southern Judah and forced the Edomites to submit to the circumcision and to the law, um, which they finished doing all this around 125 B.C. Um, and so then, besides that, that was kind of... Um, I already explained about how they, they had that province, Idumea, which was still kind of a thing, um, and how Herod the Great actually was a, um, excuse me, an, an Edomite. I already mentioned that. But by about 100 AD, which is about uh, 60 years after Jesus, Edom, the, the people of Edom were basically a part of Israel. They, they had pretty much just, they were pretty much Israelites by that point because they had been, you know, they had taken on the law, they had taken on the circumcision, they had been in the area, they had interbred. It was just kind of, they, they, their national identity was like nothing. They, they, so, you know, literally Israel consumed Esau. They, that literally fulfilled. Um, so that, the thing that got me thinking is, is this very simple question. Don't try and answer it. I don't think there is an answer. Was God commanding Israel to burn Esau, or 
was Israel burning Esau an unavoidable result of what was going to happen? See, because he doesn't actually ever say, God doesn't actually ever say here, be a house of, of flame and burn Esau like stubble. He doesn't actually give a command. So I guess it could be either way, and I, this is something that I don't want to give you an answer. I just want you to think about. So that takes us to the last section, the good, good news, verses 19 through 21. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau, and those of the Shephelah, the Philistine plain. Also they will possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and Benjamin, the territory of Gilead. So he's going through all this. In, in the Hebrew, this, is, this section is kind of difficult. And there's multiple ways it can be translated, but we're just going to go ahead and stick with this for the sake of simplicity. So we'll go through it one, one at a time. Then those of the Negev, that's the southern the southern uh, desert of, of, the, of the area of Judah, I've already explained that, they're going to possess the mountains of Esau. So whereas Esau was coming out and conquering to move into southern Judah, southern Judah is going to go over and they're going to conquer that. So we're talking about moving um, south kind of, south and kind of east-ish. Um, and those are the Shafala, which is the foothills. So Israel has like this – if you look at their geography, they have like the coastland. Then they have like these, these hills, and then you get to like this mountain range, and then you get to this deep canyon kind of deal where like the Dead Sea is. And then you have like the Jordan Mountains on the other side of, of, of where like the nation of Jordan is now. Um, so when it says the Shafala, that's the foothills next to the coast between the mountains and the coast. So, okay. Um and those of the Shephelah, the Philistine plain. So the the people at the footholds, they're going to move out into the west and south and conquer uh, the Philistines. Um, also, they will possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, which was to the north. So they're going to move north as well. And Benjamin, which is the smallest of the tribes, will possess the territory of Gilead, which is on the other side of the Jordan. Um, if you know anything about their history, Babylon, I mean, sorry, um, uh, Benjamin had a history um, with Ramth Gilead. Anyways, uh, and so you're, you're, you have this progression of kind of moving south, west, north, east. And the exiles of this army of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. Now there I have to, have to stop because there's multiple ways this can be translated. First off, um, it, notice there it says, and the exiles of this army of the sons of Israel. Once again, Israel as a, as a whole entity is not talking about just the southern nation. He's talking about the remaining tribes. Sons of Israel, um, Israel had been destroyed for over 100 years. At this point that this prophecy was given, Israel was already destroyed. Jerusalem was pro had probably just been destroyed as well, but Israel had been gone for a long time. And he still talks about them like they're one united people, um, obviously pointing to God's, God's plan in all this. Um, and the wording here conjures the conquest of Canaan. I've already mentioned that. Israel once again regained the inheritance. If you notice the wording specifically, the exile of this army of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Arafath. Why bring up the Canaanites? Because he's bringing up that, that, that kind of the idea of the conquest again. Um, And then another thing I wanted to bring out is that Obadiah, remember, you have to remember where, where he's at. He's talking to a bunch of people who are refugees in their own land. Everything that they have ever known is destroyed. These are poor, the poorest and the weakest remains of Israel. These are not like the rich and powerful. They are off in Babylon. Like These are just the, the people that nobody wants. And he's talking to them about all these big plans of, of what God has to do and how, and they're, how they're going to get their land back and all this stuff. And they're just a bunch of poor and weak people. Like they've been, you know, they're desolate. If you could use that word, I guess would be a good word. Um, so the goal of the conquest, though, was to have Israel united in worship, and that's exactly what the focus is here. Mount Zion is going to be holy. The people are going to be holy. They're going to get their land back. Um, so it's very much so an, an emphasis on on uh, things being as they should. So here's the here's the difference of translation that can happen here. It can be at the very last line. Um, the army of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, or I can read this. W um, the sons of Israel will dispossess the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, in which case, is it talking about them conquering the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, or is it talking them about them living amongst them as far as Zarephath? Either way is possible. Um, a lot of people have argued back and forth. I don't really see that there's 
a clear answer in sight. So this is the last of it, the end, the, the last thing to say about um, about these verses. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad will possess the cities of the Negev. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Now, when I first read this, I thought it said the deliverer will ascend Mount Zion, in which case you'd be talking about Jesus. This is not talking about Jesus, which is one of the things that surprised me, because a lot of the prophets um, talk about the coming Messiah and stuff, and that's kind of their highlight. Oh, but it doesn't, doesn't end with the coming Messiah, which is kind of odd. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad, where the heck is Sepharad? Well, it's possibly Sardis. It, it could be a place around Babylon. It could be any, another name for Babylon, but ultimately we don't, we don't know. I don't know. So wh wherever that is, the context makes it sound like these are the people by, in Babylon. The exiles of Jerusalem who are in Babylon, will, they're going to come back and possess the cities of the Negev. That makes sense, but ultimately we don't know. Um <clears throat> So the main idea here, Israel will expand into what they were supposed to be, and they will have the people to live in the cities. They aren't just going to own a bunch of empty cities. They're actually going to have people living in the cities. This is kind of a kind of a, a big thing for people who have just been annihilated by Babylon. <laughs> um, but if you notice here, this human authority that's going to come is delegated. It's not ultimate. See, the deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. It's not going to be a, a, an ultimate human authority. God's going to be the one behind this. So it says they're deliverers. This, you know, this can also be translated as saviors, um, not Jesus. The, this is people God will, or depending on how you see this fulfilled, did raise up to free Israel. Um, I personally think that Obadiah was completely fulfilled at this point. I don't think that Obadiah is talking about anything that's yet to come. Some people might disagree with me on that. It's your own right. Um, but one of the big ideas here is that it, it was not Marduk of Babylon, the god of Babylon, that has done this or ruled the nations. It was Yahweh. The, con the kingdom will be the Lord's. The one who was behind all this, the one who worked through it, it was Yahweh. It, it looked like for a time that Marduk had won, that, that Babylon was, I mean, that Israel was abandoned, but at the end of the day, the kingdom will be the Lord's. And uh, kind of ending on that triumphant note, um, Obadiah is very much so focused on um, the physical aspects over the spiritual. I know a lot of spirit, a lot of prophets are more focused on the, like Ezekiel. I mean, that guy gets way into the spiritual stuff. Obadiah keeps it almost, he, in fact, like I mentioned, I think it was last week, when he's talking about, you know, um, the nations against Esau, he doesn't even mention God rising against them. He, he mentions about, you know, how they're going to face human justice. Um, so Israel is going to get the land back. The people God uses will be victorious and judge as God has appointed them. That's the main idea of what's going on here. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Um, as far as what translation I used for this, I used the NASB 2020, um, which is very much so different from the NASB 1995. So some simple applications from the book of Obadiah. Whether we are right or wrong, when we mistreat someone, God will remember. It's important that as Christians we don't try and justify having a bad attitude and, and mistreating others. Even if the other person is the bad guy. We as Christians are not called to do that. And I think that Esau is a perfect lesson that with that word. How could you have done this to your brother? But God, they deserved it. Well, yes, but that's not even the issue. It was not your place. <laughs> Let God be. In fact, Paul talks about this. Leave vengeance to the Lord. <laughs> you're taking up all the space for vengeance and God can't God can't bring justice because you're trying to make it yourself. You know, and it's 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 one of those things where it's kind of like butt out and let God handle his his thing. When we mistreat someone, even if we're mistreating the enemy, even if we're mistreating the bad guy, God's going to remember it. Um, and it will return on our own head, as, as he told Esau too. God has not called us to curse or to punish others. He has called us to love and serve. That's a, extremely difficult. Anytime we go through something bad, we say the same thing. God, remember how they mistreated me. Strike them down and all this stuff. Even Jesus' own apostles, right? And they, he, they're all going and he's like, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire and burn this place out? Just annihilate this whole town? And Jesus is like, oh my gosh. <laughs> just no. Just shh. Sh you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, sh <laughs> Let's play the quiet game, apostles. <laughs> Anyways, God has not called us to curse or to punish others. He has called us to love and serve. Um, the very least you can do is butt out. 
if Esau Esau wasn't didn't get in trouble because they didn't help Israel, they got in trouble because they didn't butt out. They tried to hurt Israel. Sometimes in the natural now you might say how how does this work in the real world? Okay, so that you you've got an enemy. Right, and you're not supposed to go and make things worse for them. You're not supposed to be happy when they're destroyed. So what am I supposed to do? Well, sometimes in the natural progression of things, you will have opportunity to help someone. If you have an opportunity, don't neglect that. If, for instance, here's an example of that. In the law, if you saw your enemy and they they were stuck with their with their donkey in in a ditch and they were trying to get it out, you were supposed to go help them. You didn't have to follow your enemy around. You didn't have to, you know, make your whole world about, you know, dancing around them, pleasing them. No, it's saying you're going by, you see them in need. Don't neglect doing the right thing. It's right there. So, you know, there is there is a little bit of people kind of go to the extremes here. Well, I'm just going to, you know, hmm. or they go to the other extreme and, you know, try to like people please. And it's like they're, they're your enemy. <laughs> people pleasing isn't going to do any good. <laughs> um so you aren't going and searching them out. You're not stalking them. You're not nagging them. You see they are in need, and so you are there. So you can you 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 do what you can. It's not one of those things that you have to you know hunt them down. Um, some people are so insecure though that they can't deal with an enemy not liking them. They want to be liked by everybody. So what they do, they literally follow after the people who hate them the most, trying to be their servant so that they will be liked by their enemy. But that that isn't what the Bible teaches us, and it's actually kind of counterproductive. For instance, Paul tells us to keep away from somebody who's contentious, somebody who causes problems, who fights all the time. Just stay away from them. People who are living in sin but calling themselves Christians, just stay away from them. And um, so, but if you are there and they need help, help them. With that being said, I do have one more thing to say. Don't be an enabler. If somebody is doing something. And they refuse to turn from it, and they keep going to you asking for help. Don't keep helping them and pull them, pulling them out of their problems, so that they never learn a lesson. You keep enabling their bad behavior. You see, parents do this all the time with their kids. Oh, my kid went to jail. I'm going to go bail them out. Oh, they went to jail again. I'm going to go bail them out. You're enabling their bad behavior. That's not what we're talking about at all. <laughs> so, anyways, um, do not be glad at others' disaster, even if it is deserved. Still, don't be don't be glad about it. So, those are just some very simple applications of the Book of Obadiah. Um, I greatly enjoyed studying this book because I felt like it was one of those books that I, I always wanted to know more about but never really did.